This is what all of Western esotericism and magic is about. Transmuting your will into action, into something that goes from being a nothing to a something. This is synchronicity. 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 <laughs> Welcome to episode 106 of Synchronicity. My guest this week is Michael Phillip, host of Third Eye Drops, a wonderful podcast. You can find it on mindpodnetwork.com. Go check it out, thirdeyedrops.com. Uh, he's one of the smartest, brightest, nicest people I've met. Um, he stayed with us when we did the Wellbeing in the Modern Age event in New York City a few weeks ago. Uh, got to hang out, got to introduce him to uh, Microduce. Microduce? That's not a thing. Microdose solution, um, which he enjoyed and got a little introduction into our good friend Jimi Hendrix. Wink, wink, nod, nod, Michael. Um, so that was cool. And it was always great seeing him. And this podcast, honestly, I usually listen to him before I do intros, but I'm not for this one. And the reason I'm not is I'm going to listen to it right after this. I'm going to experience the whole thing because I don't really remember. Exactly. I know we did some Wim Hof breathing right before we recorded this. I smoked a pretty sizable doobie and uh, we were on microdose solutions. So I vaguely remember what we were talking about, but I know it's pretty fucking cool. So I can't tell you much about this episode. Uh, I want to say a big thank you to everyone. You know what I'm going to do? I am going to in the middle of this intro right here. I'm Googling. I'm not Googling. I'm putting in the URL. I want to say thank you to all of the patrons who are supporting me on patreon.com because honestly, it's cool as fuck that you guys do this. So thank you big time to Kelsey. Kelsey, thank you for pledging uh, this month. You're on the music level a little above. That's totally fucking cool. I really appreciate it. Thank you to Denise. Thank you to Patrick. Thank you to Chameleon. I know who you are. Thank you to Andrew, Brandon, Frank, Matthew, Axel, Jeremy, Matthew. Well, let me, there's two Matthews here. I got to specify. Matthew Pancone, Matthew Smith, Kathleen Hawes, Kath, I know you, you're the best. Tess, my sister, you also rule. Yasi, James, Sean, Otto, Daniel Finger, uh, Melissa, Amy, Danielle, Kristen, Kirk, Mark, Jeremy. You guys all rule. Thank you for supporting uh, Synchronicity this way on patreon.com slash synchronicity. Um, I don't know. That's so fucking cool. I, I support some people on Patreon. I find it, you know, it warms the cockles of my heart when I do it too. Uh, thank you guys. I really appreciate it. Anyway, I don't want to take up too much time. This podcast is a doozy. Michael Phillip, go check him out. Subscribe to his podcast, Third Eye Drops, thirdeyedrops.com, on the Facebook. On the Facebook is something I just said. What the fuck? Go check him out everywhere you can. He rules. Without further ado, here is Michael Phillip. Do you feel a microdose? Um, I got to say, man. So I remember at some point I heard someone in the psychedelic community bring and and forgive me, everyone listening. If I sound <laughs> slightly hoarse, it's been a an even more intensive mouth noise filled 48 hours <laughs> than than us usual. Um, but I remember someone in the psychedelic community saying something to the effect of he wasn't sure if microdoses were placebo effect or not. It may have been Dennis McKenna. It was Dennis it McKenna. Was. And I think I relayed that story to you. And I was just like, what the fuck are you talking about? It was about? on this podcast, I think. Okay. He, yeah. Okay. Because so I've, I've microdosed quite a bit with psilocybin. And for me, maybe I'm just taking too much, but it's there, there's no possible way it's placebo effect. <laughs> it's, it absolutely has a pretty profound 
effect on my mood, on the my body, whatever. But this time, I kind of see how it could possibly be placebo effect yeah. with, with LSD. This was Alexis's uh, takeaway when she first did it. Um, I, I mean, I did it for three months, every fourth day. And some days where I kind of felt like that. But the truth is, is I am also incredibly sensitive to all of these things, mm-hmm, like mm-hmm. to to a crazy degree, which I know is baffling considering how much weed I smoke. I, and I just to be, I think baffling is the perfect amount. <laughs> it's the perfect word to describe the amount of weed you smoke. Too. It is it is baffling. <laughs> but and the truth is, is it's not like I it's my threshold and I'm not getting high. I'm blitzed. I just know how to function in that realm. So I still am very sensitive to all things. I don't think I've ever taken the LSD microdose where I've questioned whether it's working. I do think it took me probably a solid month to become familiar with how it was affecting me relative to the days where I knew like it was like a third day and I was just totally off of it. It was out of my system completely. Um, It's super subtle. And I I could see how people would be like, I don't know if it's actually doing anything. And I know people have said that um, to me. It's it's pretty. I know what to look for not now, like the hallmarks. I totally agree that the psilocybin is like you can't miss it. Like that's that's unmissable. You know. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I completely agree. I completely agree. I I think with and I was discussing this yesterday with um some of the people that we were Julia and um, Kelly people that were involved in the the event that just happened, which we definitely have to talk about. But no, no, that's not allowed. We can't talk. We about can't it. talk about it. That's that's fine. <laughs> no, that's we cool. obviously yeah. are going to talk. About it. Um, but to my to my shock, I was initially shocked that Kelly had never done it. And then Julia showed up and she had never done it either. And I was like, neither one of you have ever experienced psilocybin. No, no. Julia has. She not, said she not said, microdose. She said she threw up. So she oh. didn't. She didn't. Yeah, have, it doesn't count. Yeah, no, oh. it doesn't count. So, um, oh, shit. which I mean, I get it because there is a there's the anxiety of what am I about to go through, which already gives you the, the yeah. rumbly tumbly. Yeah. And then um, once it hits, there is what I, you know, have just come to call the adjustment period of like this sort, sort of like wave of reorientation that occurs because um, I've heard a few different explanations that make sense to me. One Obviously, it bonds to your serotonergic receptors, and you have quite a few of them in your gut. Yeah, um, people think of it as just your brain, but you have quite a few in your gut, so that could be part of the nausea. Um, and I also think it's because it has such an effect on your uh, visual acuity. You're sort of mm. recalibrating, you know, like mm. and you know, balance comes into play and all of that stuff. So whatever it is, that's sort of how I I think of it. And so I get the I get the nausea is my point. Um, however, afterward, that's as, as everyone knows, listening, that's when, you know, you get the, you get the benefit and the, you, you experience everything that's worth experience. I think the anxiety is worth experiencing too, but, um, but I would you, be scared if there wasn't anxiety. Right. That's when I would actually be freaked out. Yeah. Seriously. Yeah. Like that would be like, oh, this is something is amiss here. I think the healthy dose of whether you want to call it anxiety or just anticipation like that, if that doesn't happen and I'm about to take anything. Mm hmm. I might be addicted truthfully Uh, but even when I smoke like I still kind of know if it's something I'm familiar with that maybe is a little more sativa and paranoid Mm -hmm. I'm like all right, I'm gonna make sure that contextually this is the right time to be doing this Um, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but yeah I totally know what you mean so the what I was gonna say my whole point of this this too long ramble that is my (laughs) hallmark is um, that I feel like with microdosing psilocybin I still experience all of those right those little steps like the the anxiety the okay i hope this is the right amount and then the initial like slight wave of reorientation and nausea but then just kind of being at that nice little hum when's the last time you macro dosed lsd um never so yes so here i don't you know go. if i've ever admitted that before but i, I mean no that's a huge that's yeah. that so here has been my experience with the uh, macrodosing LSD. And the first time I took it, I took the most. I, I, my guess is it was at least 600 micrograms. Okay. Um, but, uh, it was presented as each tab was 250 and it, and having taken it many times since then, um, it was a lot. (laughs) That's all I know. It was more than I had ever taken. 
Um, I still found it to be a highly subjective it, how you're describing it. Once you get past like, you know, 20, 30, you're going to have noticeable mental and psychological effects. Visuals won't be kicking in. But, you know, um, I've taken tons of LSD with no visuals whatsoever. So it is one of those things that can kind of like subtly penetrate what's going on. That's why I bring it up. Psilocybin has never been subtle in any time I've ever taken it, um, you know, from the giggly euphoric phase right before everything starts yeah. kicking in um it shifts you out of this dimension of reality pretty the elves come out to play yeah and whether it's one elf or 50 yeah 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 it's an elf um lsd is different we were talking about before the story of doc ellis and he pitched a no header hitter um maybe a no header is a better term for it no hitter uh um, in Major League Baseball. I've been on quite a no-header streak. Yeah, yeah, it's the best way to be. So he did that, and like, you know, everything you hear about LSD, and for people who've experienced psilocybin, that would be like, how could you function at a professional athlete level, especially one that requires such delicate focus and attention? Like, you have to get your muscles to do something that like a very small percentage of the world can do for a very specific thing, and how do you maintain that, let alone do something that's like vaunted in the status of the sport? So, um, LSD kind of works like that. Like you can take a tremendous amount and, you know, you can be having very different thoughts than you might be, but the world doesn't necessarily radically change. Your perception of it does. So I wonder if that has some um, impact on your initial experience. The first time I gave it to another friend who had never done any LSD ever um, said the same thing. He wasn't sure it was working. Hmm, hmm. After doing it 10, 15 more times over the course of a few months, he was like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> I get it. Duncan referred to it as my favorite term uh, when I asked him if he had done it. He called it spiritual Adderall. And mm -hmm. I was like, I was like, that's actually not a bad term. I mean, we haven't been outside yet, just so everyone's up to date. It's been about an hour, maybe an hour yeah, and a half. Yeah. When you go outside and just kind of go through the day's experience, uh, you know, you're good at noting what's going mm -hmm. on. See if there's anything. Now, you could make the case that maybe we're just settling into the moment because we've perceived we've taken a substance. Um, that's why I do think the regularity of consuming microdoses is like a is a necessary thing. Th this whole like 48 hours has been a bit of a, a tweaking reality type of set of circumstances anyway, just because it's been like, this is the kind <laughs> of stuff I want to be doing with my life full time. So it's like, it allows me, you know, as anybody with a creative project knows that they're not making their living from, it's sort of like you're occupying these adjacent realities to an extent, a reality where you can just disappear and plug into what your passion is leading you toward. And then one is an, I mean, sure, that can be an obligation as well. But you're also on the leash of, you know, whoever's giving you the points you need to put food in your mouth. So that leads to this sort of, you know, tug of war for your attention. And for the last few days since I've been in New York and we've been doing this Whitma event, I've essentially been living in the like, this is what I want. This is like where I want to be at all times hey, man. mind state. And that that's already reality altering. And then also just, I mean, is there anything more psychedelic than connecting with other human beings that are on the same wavelength? And it's like you're augmenting and enhancing one another's like, my, it's like, you go from having whatever your little micro superpower is and, right, and the right. way that you can influence other people positively. And then you're like collectively coming together to exponentially increase that thing <laughs> in that moment. And it is powerful, man. I, I think I told you that, you know, and, and this is going to sound so like cliche and, and wooey, but, you know, we started the whole event with a uh, setting an intention and a meditation and you know, I, of course, I'm I'm going to like play along and whatever parts of me are like, I don't know if I want to do a med real meditation right now. You know, that that all kind of sinks away because everybody's doing it and you're the dick if you're not. So I'm like, all right, I'm doing this. I'm 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 doing this. And then we had these fantastic musicians there. Yeah. I and Tyler. Yeah. And oh, my God, man. Like, so she she's just a she's just one of those like fairy like beings who's just, you yeah. know, so ethereal. Yeah, she's very ethereal. Yeah. She's just perfect um <laughs> to give people a visual they're sitting on a floor um on my sister's cushions we yeah had to bring those from some, the, some, <laughs> we some brought very, those over yeah some some very nice colorful pillows and um 
the male of the two. What did you say his name was? Tyler. Tyler. The male of the two. The, the male, male of the, the two. Um, he was the man behind the noises that were not vocally induced. Right. And, you know, he had his synth plugged in and his his MacBook and whatever. Um, and he's just playing kind of ethereal pad type sounds. But then she starts doing these like, is it a language or is it just? Yeah, she was singing um, a, a chant. Um, okay. The first one was a Surya chant, which oh, yeah, is yeah, like yeah. a sun chant, heart centered yeah. practice. Um, I don't know what the se- second one was more like a composition, mm-hmm, probably mm-hmm. something, but I didn't hear discernible words. Yeah, yeah. And then she starts harmonizing with herself, like yes. looping her voice. Yes, that's and it's what just she did. like when the harmonies kick in. I don't know what it is, but harmonies just always like kind of hit me right in the in the vagus nerve, like in the in it's the throat. And it's just like I had a moment where I was like so moved within two minutes that I had to like actually open my eyes from the meditation. <laughs> So I didn't start like having like a moment, a blubber. Like, <laughs> I didn't want to like be sitting there crying in front of like 300 people. So, so yeah, those moments are very powerful and, and being able to visit those moments more regularly over the course of, you know, 48 hours starts to really make reality feel different. Yes, you know? it does. And I think a lot of what we talk about on our respective podcasts are different modalities and tools we can find that allow us to get into those moments or feel those moments when they're happening. I mean, my basic contention is those moments are always around us. And Mm -hmm. it's kind of like if someone you're passing on the street is talking about a topic that you know something about, you're going to recognize it and maybe have some input or thought related to it. Whereas if you're walking by someone's street and they're talking about something you don't know what it is, that's not going to be important to you at all. So it's it's a process, I think, of not adding and learning more, but getting more in tune with what's around you so you can kind of intuitively understand it, even if you don't grok the whole concept. And I think this is something that people naturally do um, as they kind of open themselves up to the world, right? They just get better. We were talking about it too. I mean, um, how comfortable we felt being moderators at this event because of the podcast we were doing, but also um, anyone who's dabbled in any type of public speaking or any broadcasting stuff, um, over time, you just get more comfortable speaking with people naturally in life. Um, and I think that is something that is not just this process of like practice makes perfect, but it is this kind of evoking this uh, feeling of connection, interconnectedness. Mm-hmm. It's, it's interesting. I didn't know you were so moved by the uh, the I was too, just to be clear. Um, I heard them, you know, through a SoundCloud link and I was like, wow, this is really awesome. Um, and I was blown away how good they were in the space and yeah, how well they were it very worked. Good. It was um, it was flawless. I mean, yeah. especially knowing. I remember we were talking about like Noah and I are both. You know, Noah's very <laughs> experienced in in sound arrangement and and making electronic music. I've been a musician and stuff as well. Um, and we've worked a lot of electronic stuff and looping stuff into my former band's sets in the past. And we we're kind of discussing whether she was doing it live or not and she was right like she really was yeah we were yeah. we were debating whether there was a harmonizer right, on her right. thing which, or if she was just har- harmonizing with her own loop looping live. and which is the second of the two is significantly harder to right. do because you actually have to be on pitch right. live while you're doing it to be able to layer things because if yeah. you fuck up you have to do it again it's mm-hmm. not like an easy process um and i originally thought it was a harmonizer and you could preset that up it would be a, like a decent amount of work but that's what i thought it was and i asked her afterwards so she's like no i was layering them live i'm mm-hmm. like that's really mm-hmm. fucking awesome um the timing was perfect the pitch was perfect it was it was, it was cool well done. And i yeah. think that's like um i don't know I, I would love to hear kind of your overall impression i got a little bit of it of what the event was um i look at these events too like these are events that are meant to pierce the veil. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean it's Mm going to pierce the veil for everyone. But I think if that's the intention, that was my intention with them, um, that is available for people to tap into. Most of the events, let me ask you this. You were at both of them. Energetically, and I know this is kind Mm -hmm. of a subjective word, Mm -hmm. how did you think it compared to the LA one? I think it was actually pretty similar. And I think that that trickles down from the people who are involved you know i think i think everybody who's in attendance subconsciously is going to pick up on whatever you know for lack of a better term is the vibe that's being put out by the people organizing it i've been to other events that said where that was clearly not the case (laughs) and i've been fairly public about kind of borderline (laughs) shit talking those events because they're they're a scourge man they are a boil on people's very earnest rightful desire to go look for answers and when you run into people who are 
immediately like carving up hierarchies by saying they're channeling, you know, I don't know, some Glorb Glab 69 from the Alpha Centauri star system. How do you think they get to that point? Uh, and what do you, do I you have think several theories, man. I would like to hear them. Well, the most pure theory, of course, is that they really are in contact with something and they really believe what they're relaying to you or they're lying to themselves and they're letting something that's more likely a dream or a weird trick of their own mind. I mean, you've probably been in those states where you wake up from a dream and you feel like you were just talking to something, but you're able to be like, okay, well, that was really interesting and maybe that was significant or maybe it was just a dream. Right. But there's no like maybes with these people. It's very like- Concrete. It's very like, yeah, I'm actually from this star system and I'm, you know, what I'm whatever. And, you know, I, I would start telling you about the whole dimensional part of it because right. this is a 13th dimensional thing. But right. trying to like really explain what the 13th, the 13th dimension is when we're in the third dimension, you know, you got to go from up there. To <laughs> That's down. the type and of language. And this is an actual took. conversation I've had with people. And it's and it's infuriating because if you are seeing an event like this online and we I talk to several people like this you talk to several people like this you you see an event like this online you buy a ticket you go to it you're going because you are an existentially restless human being and you want to connect with other human beings who are earnestly going down this path and you want to make real quality connections that's not a real quality connection telling someone you're from the 13th dimension and blah 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 buy this crystal for me for $250 is is it's not real it's not real like and and what and that doesn't mean there's no real metaphysical ontological meat out there for you but if someone's presenting themselves as something that sounds like a character from a fairy tale they probably are unless they can demonstrate to you something very real in that moment to the count to the to the counter of that but anyway so no no these are that's to say that i thought the event for the for the most part was beautiful i thought the people there were very earnest and kind and i thought the people involved and the panelists and the moderators and the people uh, that you worked with to produce the event all very sweet all very overwhelmingly well intentioned. Yeah. Yeah. Despite all the, you know, <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm sure as everybody out there can imagine, if you're trying to set up an event in Manhattan with a considerable amount of overhead, there's stress involved. There's a lot of people who need to show up. There's a lot of things that need to work. And the things that could have gone wrong, by and large, did not go wrong. Yeah. Yeah. I've been thinking about that. And it's this idea. So I put up a quote that day and I never really know what the quotes mean if I do them in advance and I did this one in advance and it was an Eckhart Tolle quote and I'm not like an avid you've never heard me like really I don't mention him a lot or anything but I do think he is a a very uh, legit teacher and he has a media business too which I think is very interesting too but he he does have some real truths and he was talking about this concept of you can't change someone you can't change yourself but what you can do is create a space either internally or externally that allows what he calls grace to flow in. And what was weird about this event, and you haven't, you know, you haven't been around me for an extended period of time, but I am a spaz. Like that's my MO. Like I spaz out at shit. I've probably seen little moments here and there since we've been back home, but I didn't spaz out this entire time. And shit was going wrong on like multiple fronts. It was not going right right before the event. But I had this weird sense that like everything was going to work out, but not in like an idealistic, like mm -hmm. careless way. Mm -hmm. And I always I look back to other events in my life where that happens and it does seem to be like a hallmark. Like it's a it's an actual sensed feeling that is qualitatively different than another type of intuitive sense. That just always makes me those are the synchronicities and felt experiences that I particularly pay attention to now because those tend to center or be around very transformative aspects, not only in my life, but for the people around me and even just broader than that. So I felt the event definitely was a uh, it was that was the weirdest part of it for me. It did go well. It went great, really. Um, but that I didn't it, it freak really out. Did. Yeah, it, it really, really did. did. And, and the more I look back on it in hindsight, 
It it did go very well. And in your mention of the Eckhart Tolle grace really reminds me of the Trungpa Drala idea too, because he talks about that um, in, I think, several of his books, yeah, but I'm so. sure he talks about it in Shambhala, um, <clears throat> that you really need to create a vessel and you yourself need to become a vessel to invite what he calls Drala in. He also calls it magic, which I think is a yeah. little bit like potentially problematic because it's it's like a shiny word that like perks people's ears up but they have it's such a loaded word you hear kelly use it though uh often kelly mclean uh-huh. beca- and you know she grew up at naropa yeah, she's way more knowledgeable about it than i am and she's she's mentioned the word drola for me she actually mentioned the word drola i believe when i first told her about the event the last time she was in the city um, which was a few months ago, and she was like, "That's kind of what this is." Mm-hmm. So it's funny you mentioned I that now. I completely agree. I think if you, with the correct intention, create that space. I mean, and he even talks about it as like you have a room, like you know, you have a room. Let's say like your studio, right? Um, you can create it like by having it by doing intentional actions to organize it, to clean it, to set it up in a certain way to only enter it with a certain mindset and like treat it as a sacred space, you are inviting Drala into that space. Right. And and I try to think of that sometimes with my own home when I like don't feel like cleaning or something. Totally. But it's certainly not a 100% uh, success rate. I'm not the cleanest person in the world. Me neither. But the idea also that that can apply to ourselves, mm-hmm. right? That's mm-hmm. absolutely to link this together. What we were talking about before, which is you know people who are saying they're in communication with Zimzom seventy two from Planet Exerbius. Mm-hmm. Like no, like I always, and I we've spoke we've spoken together about this. I've spoken to people not a lot for synchronicity for the podcast who very very rarely I will get off and I'll tell Alexis I'm like ah, I don't know I yeah, don't know about yeah, that yeah like, you've been like nope yeah just like just that isn't adding up. And what you described as a process of talking to some people who are like that, I think there's something in there that actually can really be a good indicator that something is right. If they're saying they cannot explain something to you because you're not going to understand mm-hmm. it and they don't mm-hmm. offer any attempt to kind of justify that claim, they're either truly an enlightened master, which I think energetically is felt. When I get around, like for instance, at the event, we were speaking about him. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm sure he'll listen to this. Love you, John. John has this, John F. Simon has this presence about him where yeah. it's like, oh, he tapped, he, he's encountered something, whether mm-hmm. we call that the archetypal, you know, the self that Jung referred to. He has stacks of work, man. Yeah. Stacks of work. Yeah. And, and if you think this shit just comes to you without like by some <laughs> divine intervention and just like trickles into your pineal gland and blasts your third eye open. <laughs> maybe man but i've not seen it like it always it always comes with some when john f simon for people who don't know has a book he he's been doing everyday art for 20 years and that has changed this man profoundly spiritually in, intellectually and it, and it's it's very obvious yeah and it's a quality and that's what i was referring to like if someone's around you and they're saying they're talking to some crazy beings and that is felt it's not saying believe them hook, line, and sinker, but it's at least like, all right, well, maybe you can explain more. And very often, like John, if you ask him, will tell you how he did it. The funny thing is, is usually when those people tell you something, it's a very ordinary thing. Like, oh, I make drawings every day. It's like, okay, yeah, but really, what are you doing? It's like, no, I make drawings every day. Um, and often, I think this is why mindfulness is emphasized so much. Having a regular practice, whether it's meditation, drawing, whatever it is, gives you that reference point when the oscillations inevitably happen in just living life. And you can see like where am I in relation to this thing I do all of the time? What is emerging from it if John was talking? Um, yeah, that to me is kind of what life is about, right? We mm-hmm. wake up every day like that where that's our pattern. So like mm-hmm. where do we look in our own lives to get the insights that can, you know, I like the term flow state and live in the flow state. Um, but I think that gives this kind of other connotation that if you're not in that flow state, then you're out of the flow state or you're fighting against it. And I don't think that's necessarily um, what is happening. I think those out of sync phases are also necessary experiences that we have to go through, not some mistake, not mm-hmm. like we're doing something wrong. Um, yeah, man. So let me ask you this. You said you want to be doing this. We've spoken about this too. So of this course. isn't like anything. Yeah. You want to be doing this full time. Like, how malleable do you think reality is at the end of the day? That's the question. You know, like malleable kind of implies that 
you have the ability to mold, which I'm very open to, but I'm also sensitive to because I don't want to get too much into like the secret type thinking where I think I can manifest things because bad shit does happen. And if you want to pretend that it's not going to happen to you, it's going to hit you like it's going to be like a take the wind completely. I I don't know, man, because you you see these people like, you know, let's just keep picking on these these Alpha Centauri channeler type people. Like, what do they do when their cat gets hit by a car? Like, what do they do when, you know, their friend gets cancer? What do they do when they get, you know, some illness? Do they yeah. like and it just doesn't fit into the mythology that they've built for themselves? You know, like the these are real falsifiably tested parts of the human condition. They're the reason spiritual systems like Buddhism exist. Because dukkha suffering is one of the three like pillars of Buddhism, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so and it's the first, right, no right, truth. right. <laughs> yeah. So that shit's real, and that is part and parcel with existing as an incarnated being. So I think if you're not doing a regular practice like we were talking about before, you're you almost shouldn't even be like talking about some of these concepts like like not not you personally of course but people who um you know people who are talking about like manifesting shit to them but they have like no practice they don't understand what their subjective realm is at all and how that flows into reality and they haven't done work to be like i'm going to transmute this potential in my mind to something that exists externally they don't know what they're talking about they're talking about like you know like this is a world of of relationships and like cause and effect. And if you believe that you have free will, which you must believe if you believe reality is malleable, you need to utilize that will in a John F. Simon-esque way to do an action mindfully, willfully. I mean, and this is what all of Western esotericism and magic is about, transmuting your will into action, into something that goes from being a nothing to a something. And that was actually the name, I think, of one of our yeah. last podcasts is like transmuting a nothing into a something. And if if you're not doing that, like shut the fuck up about like manifestation and shut the fuck up about like shaping reality, because that is how you shape reality. That said, I don't think that doesn't mean there isn't some sort of metaphysical magnet that can kind of emerge as an o- almost like epiphenomenon of all of that effort. Yeah. And I mean, dude, you you and I being friends is yeah. an example of, of that. Of course. Me and Corey Allen being friends is an example of that. Me part being part of this um, event that just happened is an example of that. The people that were drawn there by the energy that was flowing out of that event are an example of that. So in that way, I believe it. Right. Here's, I, and I, I pretty much agree with you Almost 100%. Here's where I disagree, I think. Maybe not even disagree, but have a different viewpoint on it. I think I, I've met people who are maybe not uh, common sense smart or certainly not re- well read or really don't even know anything about spiritual practices per se. Some are good people. Some are people who I would be like, I wouldn't do that. Um, uh, and they manifest shit continuously and nonstop and insanely like just that's what they do and they manifest it so it brings examples well um i have friends who will you know talk about you know wanting a lot of money or a certain job and then they meet the person or they'll mention a celebrity just offhand and they'll meet them the next day like continuous instances and they'll be like yeah like most of them at a certain point will have read some metaphysical thing, not all of them. And they'll be like, yeah, like, you know, I manifest these things sometimes. I don't know how I'm doing it. So it makes me, this is where I think I kind of um, start to disagree a little bit with what you're saying. First of all, there's two levels of this. One, I really do, like Jim Carrey, don't think we're inherently real. Mm-hmm, that mm-hmm. doesn't mean I don't function as, you've seen me, I function like a normal human being for the most part, uh, minus the weed smoking. <laughs> but uh I don't really believe we have solid existence. I think that's the same almost as believing that, you know, someone is talking to aliens. It's obviously a different uh, reaction to that. But let's just play along with the game that we are people and we exist uh, fundamentally. Um, I think the vast majority of what we experience is done 
well below the conscious level, well below, like no doubt, yeah. almost everything. So it makes me wonder where below the threshold is the work being done. Um, and I think when you do develop a link consciously to some elements of the unconscious or metaphysical principles, whatever mm -hmm. we want to call them, um, then it gets very interesting because now you have this bridge that you can't really go from conscious to unconscious so well, but it does seem to work the other way. Unconscious yeah. stuff can create and can surface so your conscious mind is like, oh, oh, I know that's an archetype. That's a symbol. Mm -hmm. I recognize this. That's a pattern I recognize. So I think there's this level of where our conscious personas maybe transmit we're talking to Alpha Centauri or and maybe we are, maybe we aren't, who knows. But there is something going on there. And I think most people who, not all of them, not some of these people mm -hmm. are just hucksters. Let's let's be and real Some here. of them are just crazy, man. Like, some of them also- They just are. Like it, it, they can't all really be in contact with something. Because well, it, I don't think that they can have the specificity knowledge of yeah. what they're in contact with. I think this is like, when I, I've spoken about it, that, and, and maybe yeah. there's a kernel within those and, and I'm I'm trying to be nuanced here because I'm I'm a very open minded person. If you haven't heard me <laughs> speak before this, I probably sound way more skeptical than I really am. <laughs> yeah. But I feel like it's like in the scenario of me and Noah, I have to be the one to like bring <laughs> yeah, it down otherwise we're going. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> I, and I think a lot of times, I mean, I've definitely had the thought like, whoa, there is something in that. um schizophrenic person's mind right that's on to something right but there's a lot that's off like like it, it knocked down like instead of instead of the dominoes falling in an orderly fashion like something just came in and just right. fucking like kicked the whole thing over and it, it and it left a lot of like some sort of weird almost loop happening it can be a process loop. it can be scrambled it can be wrong inputs and outputs there can be a surge of something that comes into someone that their hardware isn't capable of processing there's any number of cases i mean i was going to say i'm glad you brought it up uh when i what i refer to usually is going off the deep end where i just plunged into just other layers of reality for a, a substantial period of time um schizophrenic people on the street um in boston in dc the places I was at most would come up to me and start having conversations and relatively lucid ones for how deranged they were. Um, and so that certainly led me to believe that a lot of these things that those people are experiencing, they're tuned a little differently. They haven't. And, and the unfortunate thing is, I think, with support and if that was acknowledged as like that's what's going on, a lot of those people could actually be helped and learn how to function with or without any other you know substance entering their body. Unfortunately, we look through I mean, we have a name for it, schizophrenia. We have a name for bipolar. We have a name for these mental illnesses. Yeah, we have a name for everything. And names obviously limit once you give something a name, and especially when it's a psychological state that we have a process for treating or whatever, um, that can become a pretty bad yeah. problem. Yeah, and it turns into this sort of um, objectification of a person. And actually, me and Dr. Michael Dane spoke about this on my show, who I want to connect, connect yeah, you yeah, with. Yeah. Um, but he is a, you know an analytical psychologist and in the Jungian tradition for the most part. I mean, he's not to just, to just call him a Jungian is a little bit yeah. to sell him short. But I asked him, I'm like, you know, do you use a DSM five type, you know, yeah. diagnosing people type of paradigm in right. your treatment? And he's just like, no, <laughs> like, it, cause it, for that exact reason that it turns yeah. this person into this mental illness, not right. a human being. And it's just not his treatment modality at all. And and this isn't coming from a guy who's never, um, you know, he's only just done things this way. He's worked in hospitals. He's like chaired, you know, various psychological organizations right. throughout his, yeah, yeah, yeah. his career. So he's been around the block. And I mean, of course, that's just one opinion. But I, I think that is part. Taking an analytical approach to the human mind is very difficult because it's just like and i know that that's that's actually young's word right analytical psychology yeah so it's almost weird because i understand that you're doing some sort of analysis but I, when i think of analysis i think of like spreadsheets right and the dsm5 is more like that it, it's very you know here are the features of this illness and if this person is doing this this it. and this yeah. cross reference that with this and they're probably narcissistic and they're probably depressed and they're probably schizophrenic and they're da 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 so 
that to me almost seems more analytical than Young, but Young is using different systems to describe <sighs> Young. The- Young also like you have to understand this man like is in two different talk about like bi- bifurcated like this mm-hmm. he was one of the world's leading psychologists who was in a contentious and popular feud with his teacher Sigmund Freud but on the other hand where he's having his clinical practice and you know writing his papers for medical journals he's having a psychic schism he's mm-hmm. literally thinks he's going insane he's also an incredibly talented artist um just unfortunately not a great writer um but just brilliant but also is coming to terms with like am i going insane those characters in history who are able to come through that and then communicate the experiences are like obviously that to me is amazing like that's that's the validity that's why i think he you know would say that it is analytical in some sense but then on the other ones he knows that synchronicity is not an empirical verifiable phenomenon we have to experientially go through it and how much validity validity do we lead you know how much is that can we take in relative to the other aspects of our lives i asked the question how malleable do you think um reality is i don't i didn't give you a straight answer so i'm gonna say a five (laughs) yeah five out of five (laughs) no No, i know i just was fucking around um yeah i mean i don't think we necessarily create our reality the way that some others in the new age scene would say that i don't know um i do believe we possess some elements of free will but i think the way we like to think of it like our ego maybe Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um has some aspect or control over what we do is totally wrong man i don't i don't think so i think that's the illusion sorry sorry rephrase what you just said i didn't quite catch it i don't think that we as Michael and Noah yeah. really possess a tremendous amount of influence on how our lives take shape. That said, our deeper levels of ourself, you know, what Jung would call the self, Vedic would call Atman, um, that I do think is in tune. And what when that starts to kind of unveil itself, that it very much feels like free will or destiny or like divine mm-hmm. intervention. And I think that's what this is because all of these traditions that we like to bring up and glean from and take things, none of them say that we're separate from whatever Mm -hmm. the state of enlightenment or perfection is. None of them say that. None of them say you have to go do this to get this. They say here are some methods for arriving at what is already there. Mm -hmm. Um, So yeah, I just, you know, I I think it's very malleable. I think we see that every day. Obviously, reality changes. In terms of our control over it, I think it's the same process yeah. as everything else. Yeah. We try to get to our real selves, and then maybe we have a little more, um, not control, but insight mm-hmm. into how this stuff mm-hmm. works. You know what I mean? Yeah, it, it's tricky because at a, at a certain point, you hit a speculative wall. But we we do know that objectively, we're just born with a certain genetic hand that is extremely powerful, extremely, extremely powerful, and that y- there's only so much you can do with that hand. Like... Um, I heard a I heard um that Jordan Peterson guy talking recently about some study with twins that are separated at birth, mm. and you know like what what happened? They're genetic genetic copies of each other, but they live completely different lives environmentally. Yeah. And they're like when they fo- when they followed up with these people like twenty years later, their IQs were like identical, and like certain things about them were st- like biologically and you know, whatever, identical still. So uh, I believe, of course, that what happens to you in your life has an impact. Trauma clearly has a very huge impact on your life. I'm sure, you know, I, I, I'm i somebody who has practices and I'm somebody who tries to at least work on myself in various ways. And I think those things, of course, make a difference. But I do think you're playing with a certain, you know, deck of cards. And there's a lot of different things you can do with that deck of cards, but the deck is kind of the deck for the most part. I mean, I I, I want to check myself because I do think that there are things you can do to to disrupt and change a lot about yourself through the course of your life. But <sighs> yeah. So anyway, like whatever those like metaphysical threads that influence that deck of hand that that deck of cards or that hand you're dealt beforehand kind of turns into speculation. But it certainly seems to make more sense than it's just a completely random crapshoot. You know, a random yeah. crapshoot of like 
like semen hitting right. whatever. Just, and this it, is what happened. It, oh man, have you ever seen the footage of what happens in that flash when the when the egg becomes inseminated? No. Holy shit, dude! I gotta show you. Well, this. what is it? Because you know, I mean, there's a name for it, and there's a well. That's that's the egg like letting go of whatever, whatever. But it looks spiritual as fuck. Man. Really, like a flash it's, of light. It's a flash of light. Yeah. It's a flash of light. It hits the egg and it goes. Poof. It's crazy, man. Yeah. It's really well, I mean, cool. that's uh, Tibetan Buddhists would say that would be the moment of the soul or being incarnating. You're... That's why we're anti-abortion. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. No, I often bring that up, but I know not to get into a huge abortion thing on a podcast, but um, that throws a little mind bender in for us liberal, progressive minded well, people. Well, anybody like kidding themselves into thinking that abortion's like, oh, it's great. It's <laughs> totally fine. It's awesome. Is like, come on. No. It's not a great course. fucking thing. Of I'm course. not saying it should be illegal. And hey, live your life. Do what's best for you. Do what's best for your family. Of course. Do what's best for that potential that's child. What, that's and sometimes what... that potential child coming into the world does not have a great go of it. Right. A lot of times. Right. And you know, there's that now famous, overly talked about Freakonomics study of like, um, there was a huge, you know, there's a, that really famous crime wave that was going across New York in like, I think the 80s, 70s, 80s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, then they elected, I don't, I think it was Giuliani and he started to do the whole tough on crime bit. Yeah, yeah, the 90s. And, you know, like just throwing tons of people in prison and doing all this shit and mandatory minimums and really, really stiff penalties. And then over the course of the next decade or whatever, crime did start to go down. So he started to, you know, claim like, yeah, my policies objectively have influenced this. But the statisticians on like Freakonomics in this documentary or book realize that well actually what happened is a whole generation of crime committing humans were not born right, because Roe v. Wade born. passed. Yeah. So you had all of these like really impoverished people with really, really bleak outlooks that were just not born. Right. And is is that best? I don't know, but it's that's that's an objective <sighs> reality. I mean, this, this, you've heard this, I'm sure. You've had enough guests on your show that you've heard people talk about soul contracts. Have you heard this? I can, not in that exact terminology, but, but I But you know what, what it is. Mean. It's like you kind of uh, consciously choose to experience a life in which to learn certain lessons. Yeah, it's like you, you chose a difficult, you, you picked a game and chose a difficulty. <laughs> what do you think of that? Uh, you know, again, it's, it's, it's speculation, but I do find it compelling because a lot... So in a lot of these existential circumstances, we're we're sort of left with a a blank. We have no we have no vision into what that process was. We have no objective vision into like I can't recall doing that. But there are right. systems on Earth where I, I think so this kind of gets into the simulation theory thing a bit. Sure. And I'm attracted to that idea. I find it interesting, but I don't subscribe to it for the same reason that I would not fully mm. subscribe to like a like Maya like explanation of reality either. Mm. Because I think even though they're clearly onto something and the most bleeding edge science yeah. is telling us the exact same shit, right. that the way that we experience reality is just not real. It's right. just not. The way our senses interact with reality not real. But to start relating that to a human concept like a simulation right. is, I think, problematic because, yeah, that's the most advanced vernacular we have to talk about something right. in a similar way, but it, I'm sure it's an incomplete picture. But that said, if there is consciousness involved in human incarnation and consciousness that, when I say consciousness, I mean like a you know non-local kind of panpsychist logos not bound whatever to, Un, yeah. an unbound consciousness yes. that permeates the decision making process and then the human brain and et cetera, et cetera. if that exists it would make sense that there's a process of de- of, of decision making mm-hmm. in, in how that being is going to incarnate and that could be karma that could be something similar to karma but not exactly karma. or just a that, proper like a that could be there could law. be some sort of like like think of it this way again like a saved data 
from a previous lifetime. It's like a new game plus, you know, for anybody that's ever played an RPG. It's like yeah, yeah. you get to go into the next life with a certain amount of accomplishments or like whatever that you've built up over the course of however many lifetimes. So it's fun to think about. Yeah, it's certainly fun to think about the whole soul school idea. I, It's something I've heard enough and I think it resonates with a pretty broad cross section of people, even if they're not like just like, you know, yeah, that's what it is. Oh, that's what I've been trying to say. I think it does seem to resonate with people where most of the time they won't outwardly dismiss it unless they're physical materialists. So, I mean, I do think that there's something there. And I also think that it makes a lot of sense in my life when I can kind of put my ego to the side. I don't mean like, you know, not being prideful or something. I mean, just like actually just let it hang out next to me and not have it dictate or filter my experiences. It certainly feels like that's an accurate statement. It mm -hmm. feels like meaningful connections. And I know a lot of people would argue that these are chemicals in your brain based on familiarity and patterns. Well, part and, of it absolutely is. Of I course. Mean, my take on that is, of course it is. It would be weird if it wasn't. If physiologically we weren't having indicators that this was going on, that would be weird to me. So I think that is a manifestation of something that's a little more subtle. And that also seems to be the 10 tends to be the game or uh, concepts or theories that most of the mystics say too. Mm -hmm. They're saying, listen, what you're perceiving, you know, in your gross senses is just like you're getting like really dumbed down shit, you mm -hmm. know, like, and of course there's a function. It's not like this is dumb, like you're, you're here, but I do think that we incarnate for specific reasons. And I think if we investigate our own lives, starting with those, we can usually figure out what those mm -hmm. reasons are too. Mm -hmm. Like all of us have recurring issues, recurring fears, recurring anxieties, yeah. um, recurring patterns in relationships that aren't healthy. So, And a lot of times I think too, the best way to encounter those things, if, if you're hearing that and thinking, well, what are mine? <laughs> do, do like, if you have a regular practice, you're, you would be able to, it would kind of be embarrassing if I went through all my podcasts and just try to define what the things that I continually push as far as subject matter or, or things that are really like could be related back to therapy because yeah. you know I'm if I'm sitting there asking 75 people the same <laughs> weird existential question that says way more about me than it says about whatever their answer is <laughs> you know I know um so yeah I I think I think doing a practice and keeping track of what thoughts you run into or I mean it's a lot more direct if it's talking or writing because it's you know, it's right there spelled out in language right, for you. Right. Might be a little more abstract if it's art, but I'm sure you can still make the connection there. Um, but I, I don't even know if you really asked a question or if I just kind of hijacked. That. Either way. Oh, but you know what? I really did want to like put out to your audience because I, I've been rambling about it on my show and other people's shows. But I do think it's like it's worth exploring because when I said bleeding edge science is, you know, telling us these things, of course, everybody knows about the weird quantum physics shit. Everybody knows that atoms are mostly empty space. Everybody knows that, you know, nothing is actually still and it's all moving. But I mean, bleeding edge in terms of um, like the Dr. Donald Hoffman conversation I had recently, everybody go watch his TED talk. Do we see reality as it is? It's fucking fantastic. It has millions of views, rightfully so. And he's a mainstream scientist, tenured uh, at UC Irvine, who like make like makes other like materialist sciences scientists like stand up and be like, yeah, <laughs> like you know, what, like what's like, his general basic contention? Our senses don't see reality as it is at all. <laughs> yeah, and and they're not even supposed to because yeah. from an evolutionary standpoint, if you run game simulations yeah. like in a lab, yeah, yeah, and you're like, all right, we're gonna make this population with like a super high level of like perceptive fitness. Yes, yes, yes. And they're just gonna perceive everything as it is. They die like instantly. Yeah, because they're not they're not tuned to survive. They're tuned. So to, what like, do you think that that points to? Well, it, the death in particular. The death of the non-existence. It's in... it's it's like information overload. I mean, mm -hmm. it, imagine like running through reality on like a, a heroic dose of psilocybin, like all the time. Well, or you something. know what happens, and this is what I think why the simulations would bear this out. My theory is is that if you're getting unfiltered reality, bye bye. This isn't here anymore. Mm -hmm, we mm -hmm. get popped out. Other people around us may see us die, but we're not here anymore yeah. because that's not. This isn't reality. This mm -hmm. isn't unfiltered we know that that's why quantum physics all of these things we know that for sure even the theory of relativity like it if we look at it it 
fucks up our whole notion of time from mm-hmm, the beginning. Mm-hmm. That's why people were so against it when it came out because they were like, this doesn't, no, this ruins everything. <laughs> this doesn't yeah, make sense. Yeah. And that's what co- quantum physics is doing now. I always look at the people on the side just kind of like grinning when, mm-hmm. you know, our science comes up with something. And I do, I know he's used uh, far too much in in these types of conversations, but I love what the Dalai Lama's take on all this shit is. He's like, listen, if modern science Mm -hmm. proves any aspect of Tibetan Buddhism wrong, we'll change it. We'll fucking change it. He says that for two reasons. One, he's showing that they're not dogmatically holding on to anything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The real reason is he's like, this is what you're examining is not. Yeah, reality. the physical realm is not what we're like dealing with. We're right. dealing with the subjective repercussions of our like of the physical realm in a lot of ways or of the repercussions of just being a suffering incarnate being. Um but but to finish the, you know, oh, yeah, yeah. one more and and the other one that <laughs> I started to ramble about during the um the Whitma panel. <laughs> The emer- I believe it's emergence theory yeah. where um, essentially, and this gets back into the motherfucking Jim Carrey oh. <laughs> seems to be the, like, in the zeitgeist right now for his like little dickish rant on that red carpet that everybody yeah. like, apparently it means you're super woke if you speak <laughs> in like, like highfalutin platitudes about being nothing and, but and whatever. Note, um, note. That is high platitude and kind of what we agreed, just to be clear, in case anyone's wondering, we kind of thought he was being a dick to yeah. that woman and just in general. Right. And I've not been that person, but I've been inappropriate in terms of sharing my metaphysical beliefs mm-hmm. in the wrong mm-hmm. context. Um, I thought he was being a dick, but nevertheless, things he's mentioning do seem to call, carry right, weight for right. us. That right. doesn't mean there's not knowledge in right. like what, he's, what he's saying, right. but- you know, it's like what we were talking about before. Whenever you are around somebody who's like very earnest and transparent and genuinely on a path of self betterment and trying to help other people do those things, they don't come across like a dismissive, like, <sighs> oh, oh, what you're doing sure is dumb. Like they don't, they don't come across that way. Typically not. But I also know that if you catch anyone at the wrong time, they will mm-hmm. do that. Mm-hmm. I'm sure if you caught Chogyam Trungpa when he was pissed off, he'd yell at you. You yeah. know what I mean? Like for no yeah. good reason. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I, I feel really weird about Jim Carrey. So for if, in case you didn't know, Will, Jim, I'm going to invite you on yeah. the third eye drops <laughs> to just speak your side of it, man. This is a great opportunity. Well, he would be an amazing interview. He I really think would. He, really he really would be would. because yeah. he is tapped into something. I think celebrities, the reason they carry a lot of weight for us outside of the, you know, the archetypal impact of those vaunted figures would have is the ability to go into different projects and act and incarnate as different people, mm-hmm. I think is probably a very, very genuine spiritual practice. That's such an interesting thing to do. I, I hope I hope this isn't something we've specifically talked about on your show before. But on that note, that makes me think of, is it a blessing or a curse to be born in a high position? Depends, right? Like, you know, sometimes I think, and, and I know I've said this on someone's show before, but it wasn't mine. Sometimes I think, you're way better off being born in like a third world country where like the Dharma or some other good meaty practice is right there for you than you would be if you were born in the West and you got to go through the whole, you know, material cavalcade obstacle course of just like make a living, care about how you look, worry about getting all of this societal acumen that is just forced upon you. If you were just born in the East and you didn't have to jump through any of those hoops and they're just like, yeah, you got no prospects. Doesn't nobody cares what your name is. Nobody cares about who you are. Be way easier. Just be like, I'm just going to go be a monk. It is. You know? <laughs> like, I mean, again, I don't always pop it up, but the Dalai Lama, like when the question was asked to him, when Westerners were getting to know him, like, you know, what do you do about like self-loathing and like self-hatred? He was like, what? What? They are unfamiliar with the concept because mm. these social constructs and cultures aren't created around them, especially in Tibet, where they're they were an isolated nation state for thousands of years. Like people in China didn't touch them; they had no access really to the outside world, which is why so much of Tibetan Buddhism is like kind of the macrocosmic version of going into a cave in the Himalayas. Like as a society yeah. and culture, they did that. Um, yeah, I mean, <sighs> it's a very interesting question about how to engage with the world um, in Western culture. I particularly think of it as 
Um, more like the left-hand path, more like the tantric path, more like if you're born in the West, surrounded by all of these potential vices and things like mm-hmm. that's for that's for a reason. And maybe it is my very clever, tricky narrative making mind that wants to put everything in context and put the puzzle pieces together. But I see in the West as a culture and society, even in just in this country, people have like really similar problems, you know, like really similar problems. Some of them I believe are socially and culturally, that's why we have them. But it also seems like a lot of people are born with a lot of these things. So I, I, it could be a grass is always greener if you were in a place where identity wasn't built up so much, it'd be easier. But I also think there's so much to be learned by going into this shit. That's why like with the well-being in the modern age event was about to me. Like that's like, yeah, we're all on the path of being, semi-normal humans Mm -hmm. we're not going to be the people who go into the caves and do these extraordinary things and you know if you do that then you can be like me we're trying to figure out how to collectively and individually it would almost be nice if someone (laughs) did portray it that way like yeah man you can be just like me if you be an ascetic and go meditate nonstop for a year, but it's never that. It's no. never somebody who actually did the work. They and, never say that. No. They never say that. And even if they did do the work, usually they're like, you can come this way if you want. Oh, and look what. But it's, they're not going to like, they're not going to, you know, like people from any, do any pe- people from any mystical tradition really evangelize the shit out of their path? Like, I'm not seeing like Kabbalists or Sufis. Or no, you know, only internally mystic, yeah. where they would be familiar with the validity of that. They're not trying to sell it. They're not going door to door and like no. saying, "Hey, come do this." <laughs> I'm yeah. sure ayahuasca door to door salesmen are just around. Yeah, the shamans either. They're not like you got to come drink ayahuasca. Like it's it's always like if you're called to do it, do right? It. Um, and I think that again speaks to kind of the energetic principles of you know what is going on at a deeper level if we're acknowledging that maybe our senses aren't seeing reality as it is what is then what what tools do we have to actually come closer to perceiving even if it's just the shadow cast off a tetrahedron Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. what can we use to get a better idea of what the original figure looks like um well then you know unfortunately there's you know, one of my go to rants is how we're, you know, at the nexus of all of this information that's ever been presented. And in a lot of ways, that's really fascinating and useful. But it also has the like, you know, being perpetually in the middle effect as well. And so if I analyze the question you, you just asked, you know, how do we then measure reality better? The, the answer depends on what reality is like, is it material reality? Is it society? Is it a reality where all of that is illusory and the only thing that's real is consciousness? Because if it's that, then what supports then, then consciousness? There, well, then consciousness is the only real thing and everything else isn't real. And then the so question- you can't you can't perceive it or you can work on yourself to maybe get more in touch with it. But it's funny because when people are talking about reality and influencing reality, they're assuming that that's outside. That's why I always right. ask. Right. It's right. It's not. It's our internal. This is a very almost impossible concept to fully grok. Um, I can only get it on some level that words aren't going to capture. But there, uh, the connection between inner and external psyche and matter um, is very real. Um, that's why people who are not aware of how they're manifesting things can manifest things. I've seen it. I've seen it too much. Like I've seen the person who more often than not, if they're playing a lottery ticket, will win. Right? Call it karma, call it whatever you want, call it their intention setting and achieving it through the secret or whatever it is. I've seen it. Um, yeah, man, I I think it points to, okay, so let's say, let's go back to the thing. Let's say consciousness. We'll go with that theory. Consciousness is the stuff. That is what creates what we're is, doing are, are, okay so to to fully define is this a disembodied all pervasive like animating field is this a consciousness with an intention yes is it multiple consciousnesses I, I believe um there is a quality of support for this consciousness tibetan buddhists would call it this and i don't you know i'm just using their language it's the union of bliss and emptiness emptiness not as a void emptiness as a template blank template or a canvas that sounds very similar to quantum physics of course that's why i was saying it's he says it tongue in cheek because that's what it is um 
which means we have two things there, right? right. We have a template. Neither then, can exist without the other, and they're entangled, basically. Right, and then we have this weird word, bliss. That's a, another loaded motherfucking word. We could probably reference experiences we've had and categorize them as bless, bliss is the, to the best of our ability. But to me, we're having two things as our pillars of reality, actual reality. Observer, observed, and uh, yin yang correct right and what i would even go to give them qualities if we want to go to the qualitative elements of them i would call the emptiness wisdom or clarity that's just clear emergence potential for something so there's no colored perspective or subjectivity there and then we have bliss which i would refer to as unconditional love if i want to get real woo or compassion if we want to get more practical I believe that's the support of our reality. I don't mean that our reality is more light than dark. I mean, those two things are the basis of actual reality. How that integrates in with our reality here, of course, there's a profound effect on it, um, but I don't think it's as simple as like, there's good and bad, and you need to be good, and then you won't be bad. That is definitely not what it's about. And people who play that game inevitably come crashing back down to the 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 truth that that's not what's going on. Um, that's why, to me... It can be looked at as an escapist attitude, but I do know this deep in my heart. The best thing I can do is get my shit as straight as possible, If especially if I'm going to interface with our 3D reality. That's why whenever, and, and that doesn't mean that's everyone's path, just to be clear. Working on yourself doesn't exclude taking action out in the world or doing something. It just means that has to be going on too. Yeah. Um, and I don't think that process ever ends. Um, as I do believe enlightenment is possible. I do believe that people can get to that state. Um, but I also know that if you believe in the concept of a bodhisattva, that you're going to stave off that state as long as possible so you can clue in other beings to be like, no, you don't have to suffer. Mm -hmm. It's not a predeterminate. Mm -hmm. uh, suffering isn't a, um, dukkha isn't a prerequisite for existence. It's a hallmark and um prereq for this type of existence mm -hmm. doesn't it's not does not necessarily extend to all universes everywhere the buddhists even have concepts of pure land and buddha realms mm -hmm, where that mm -hmm. doesn't exist yeah certain um, sects yeah so yeah i mean that's that's something that i don't explicitly say and communicate that often but that has been experientially in my own life validated enough um with crazy weird synchronicities practical down to earth relationship stuff that that is kind of my metaphysical viewpoint and i haven't found anything that to date shakes me or mm. off of that or doesn't like have a way to fit into that so either i found like very clever way to feel comfortable most of the time or i think there is something to it that pops up in a lot of different places yeah and i mean you you know down in your own heart how much of that is like real yeah. or how much of that is confirmation bias. Yeah. Like all of us have a degree of confirmation bias that like <laughs> attracts us toward a certain viewpoint. Of course. I mean, I talk I talk about consciousness and panpsychism and logos and all these <laughs> concepts all the time, even though I don't know if they're fucking real. I don't know if they're real. The materialists may be right. I may be wrong. I may be attracted to it yeah. because it's an existential wriggling and I'm afraid to die, which of course everybody is. Yeah. Um, but if you dig deeper, that's that that what that aspect of digging yeah. deeper. I think there's an ability to question that that can last forever. Mm -hmm. But once you get familiar with, you know, who are really good at this naturally for the most part of generalization, women. This mm -hmm. is why most men have an incredibly difficult time interacting with women in most situations, in relationship situations. Okay. Is because they naturally are able to know things better than most guys. Yeah. In my experience. Um, Careful. If you're going to broad brush women, you better do it positively. Well, it's, a very, it, it's both positive and negative. I've yeah. lived around women for the majority of my life in homes with them. I I, I have some observations. Um, I actually came out of one. Yeah, me too. Weird. Um, but I think they naturally can slip into this intuitive knowing state. Now, the danger, as we know with ourselves, um, is emotions can color that intuitive faculty because we're mm -hmm. not using our senses or logic to necessarily get at the answer. However, I think when you're talking about panpsychism or some of these things, there is always that part. And this is the this is what I think is probably, David Nickturn told me this, um, and it was just in passing, but I felt it carried weight when he said it. Um, and he said, you just have to learn how to listen. Like that's what it is. That's what the skill is, mm -hmm. learning how to mm -hmm. listen to what is really real like if you've ever prayed right and you know like when you want to pray when you pray for something um 
and like you're like kind of like putting on the prayer yeah you know like oh, yeah. yeah and you know it and you're like, i can't get around it and then sometimes like there's just this deep like level of like oh my god like i'm praying for this and i'm really connecting with it that's the different differentiation and i think if we can cultivate that skill of getting to that place um, by clearing away a lot of the other mm-hmm. stuff that becomes a, a hell of a fucking beacon um, and that that allows you to kind of maybe move from the speculative putting it in the speculative aspects of being like this is an experience yeah. this is a thing that and and just like you said never holding anything up that comes from your mind as an absolute truth yeah. it needs yeah. to hit a lot of different thresholds for yeah. it to be like okay that's that's something i'm really yeah gonna yeah and that reminds me of that kierkegaard quote that it's like prayer isn't to change the mind of god it's to change the mind of the person yeah. right i mean because obviously any god that you can pray to and change its mind is like some sort of you know at best like king whose like whims change at the drop <laughs> at like one plea like, that's ridiculous it would not be a good situation that's, a, that's of course ridiculous but if you think of it as you're putting out an earnest cry to the deepest part of yourself that is connected to that ocean of consciousness and you're trying to change your fundamental intention that is very profound and that is very like in tune with the sort of overarching goal of any spiritual practice right and that and that has an immense amount of practicality that that's the whole point is to change yourself into this being that is on the path of self-realization of helping other people of decreasing suffering so i think in in that way like prayer is just one of the most beautiful things in in, in the child like you know please give me 50 Ninja Turtles toys. It's like, it, it it's it's almost like endearing in a way, but yeah, it's, it's, but it's, it's not, dumb. It's not the practical yeah. value of it. I mean, I think prayer touches on the concept of surrender, right? That is kind of what you're doing. And whether you believe you're surrendering to a higher power or source or yourself, um, it's kind of the same process. It's kind of like psychic castration, man. It's like psychic neutering. It's like, help me shed this bullshit. Help yeah. me shed this frontal lobe searching, you know, for the, the best deal of like a sports <laughs> car, like with a cool with a big engine in it. Help me stop caring about this material nonsense and just focus the majority of my weight on that more noble path. That was Chogyam's Chogyam Trungpa's whole process for cutting through spiritual materialism Mm -hmm. is every time you put on a piece of armor or think you're uncovering something, you have to identify it and take it off until you're just there with no expectations, no beliefs. That's why everyone talks about being present, right? Totally. Yeah. Yeah. And and yeah. And I'm I'm glad this is going back in the direction of meditation because, you know, you you and I just did like one of the things that I think is the most unbelievably grounding things possible, which is just like letting your breath take over your body, you know, and like if you do like a pranayama exercise or a Wim Hof style, like, you know, just um, for people who haven't done it, like taking a slow, deep, but strong breath fully in like, and then you let that breath go and you just keep doing that over and over and over again. Very soon you will enter a state of mind that is ancient it's it's older than language it's you know at the core of like your physiology before 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 everything all the layers that have been pushed on you by culture and by history and by genetics you're going to like dig into that that autonomic nervous system the parasympathetic nervous system all of that stuff you're reconnecting with all of that and if you're not doing that you don't understand yourself you don't understand you're you're living in a new part of your brain all the time. And I think to get to that part, that place that we're talking about, that that place of like spiritual castration or a more pure, <laughs> pure path or whatever you want to call it, it's basic. It's really, that's really the basic. Problem. Yeah. That's that's the problem that I think with a lot of these things is as time moves on, things inevitably, at least where we are right now, get more and more complex right? There's more connections to be made. There's more neural nets to integrate into the whole and the collective. And what we don't, you know, if you're a beginner or just getting into this stuff, you want to seek out, you want to find every possible thing. You want to, you know, adorn yourself with the physical or mental or psychic things you can put on. 
And then you come back to this very natural truth, which is this shit is really simple. And we tend to constantly overlook just how simple it is, sometimes because it's hard. Sometimes because we're lazy. Yeah, and, simple doesn't mean yeah, easy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Simple just doesn't clear, mean yeah. easy. In like fact, these techniques all is. sound very simple, but like, okay, do do the breath that I just described 50 times and see if you thought that was super easy. And then see if you can keep it up, which is this idea of a regular practice. And I can tell you when I've let my regular practice wane, um, I feel right. less stable yeah, when I when I look back on it, I feel significantly less stable. And that again could be a placebo, it could be a mental contract, but I can say with fair a degree of certainty now when I started it back up earnestly. So my my regular practice is I chant the Hanuman Chalisa either in my head or externally. And I've done it for th- four years now um every day thereabouts probably miss like a couple of weeks in between, mm. but um I, it became rote at a certain point. It became like I knew it, I could do it, I did it, I'm done. And it lost kind of the living oh, yeah, yeah. thing it had. And I think co- that's the other aspect when we're talking about a regular practice. Like that doesn't mean it lost energy itself. It means that my connection to it wasn't there. And once I kind of reestablished that, and it took time, I couldn't just will that to happen. It began to kind of have this energy, this living presence mm-hmm. to it, which I was able to identify. And I, I this just recently happened the past two months. Um, it's, it's kind of interesting. And I would be interested to ask somebody who is deeply entrenched in one of these traditions a question like this. Is it supposed to become that or is it supposed to become because that is kind of the point of a mantra is to be an inert noise, right? Like a like if you're just something like. I know like if you do TM or something right. or you get a um, mantra, it, that's just like a sound. It, they don't tell you like, here's your mantra and this is what it means. They tell you this is just your mantra. It doesn't mean anything. It depends. Mantras like anything else, you're going to have yeah. different functionalities for them. Um, yeah. I mean, I wasn't, I started doing the Hanuman Chalisa not because someone told me to do it. I thought I was get something. I was at a Ram Das retreat. I didn't know what the fuck these were. I smoked a joint. Um, as <laughs> surprise, mm-hmm. went inside, um, had a probably one of the most insane experiences of my entire life was not on any psychedelic outside of the weed um, and immediately knew that I would be basically doing this and mm-hmm. I learned it and then did it. What it became to me is 40. It takes about minimum like five to eight minutes to do the whole thing. Mm. Um, it's just the mindfulness. What practice. does it look like on paper? How long? Uh, three pages, four oh, wow. pages. Okay. Yeah, it's it's fucking long, man. Um, and what is the content? I've never. Okay, I've never so the content it. is is it's a um, chant written by Tulsi Das, who was a scholar, mm-hmm. um, a Vedic scholar, and he wrote it in praise of Hanuman. Who Hanuman is the monkey god yeah, in yeah. the Ramayana, or I don't say that right, I know, but whatever. Um, who was essentially a de- devotee of Ram. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's a very long chant, basically extolling the virtues of Hanuman and also spe- specificities of what he did. Mm-hmm. Um, the functionality of it is it's supposed to open up your heart. Um, and I can say without a doubt for someone who comes across it and really gets what it is, it does that without a doubt. It's, and it's, it's um, borderline uncomfortable, Because you become kind of not a mushy person, but you're open hearted, which is sometimes a dangerous thing to be in our modern world. Um, But the impacts are profound. Mm -hmm. But over time. And and that's why like one of the main images of him is like ripping his own heart out. Right. So no, it's like he's serving like he's living to serve. Yeah. So this is actually a funny story. So he goes through this whole thing. Hanuman saves uh, um, uh, Sita, who is Ram. Ram's wife, consort, um, Rama's wife. So he rescues her through this whole crazy thing. And one of the cool things about Hanuman is, this is why I love the character of Hanuman. Um, he is a divine being with all mm. these crazy, he's like a basically like a super god. But he fucked around with the sun at one point in his adventures when he was a kid. Um, and the sun was like, fuck you, man. Like you're a little rapscallion. You're not going to remember this shit unless someone reminds you that you have all these mm-hmm, powers. So he goes mm-hmm. on this whole adventure. He has all these powers. He saves the day. And then someone accuses him of being a phony. It's like, you don't really love Rom. Like, you're just doing this because you're really. Bleh. So he, what he does is he literally rips open his chest and shows inside of all of his bones and his heart. He literally has Rom and Sita in his heart. And he's like, all right, 
He's like, oh, okay, maybe you do care. <laughs> like, okay, 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 all right, I'm gonna step back. Um, but yeah, I mean, the prayer itself, like the chant itself, um, really is just an opportunity to identify and interact with the energy, but it becomes a mindfulness practice. You very quickly realize as you're doing either an external or internal chant that takes five to eight minutes, how many different thoughts you can have as you're doing this in another mm -hmm, language mm -hmm. and how many observations you can stack on top of that as you continue to do this, which really just over time starts to like show you that yeah, you know, there's a lot more going on than we typically can tune yeah, into. So. Yeah, and that's why I like the breathing too is because you you obviously still, your mind is going, you're having thoughts, you're wondering if you're doing it right, right. you're kind of counting, you're doing all these things, but it's still overwhelmingly about continuing to do the breath. Right. So even though there are still other things stacked onto it, I find it to be one of the more clearing practices totally. you can oh it's incredible man um i i haven't tried this but another thing i've enjoyed in the past and i guess the the uh validity of binaural beats has been called into question by like i had this guy dr andrew hill on my show and he wasn't shy about telling me that he thought they were bullshit however what isn't bullshit is the fact that by having them in your ears as you're doing a meditation and for people who haven't heard it um, what you're doing is you're putting two slightly different frequencies in your ear. So in, in one ear and the other ear. So you're hearing like a kind of an overtone that's created by the, the dissonance in the two pitches, which is like a yeah. kind of thing. And when something's out of tune, that's what And it's like. supposed to, you know, emulate whatever brainwave you're going for. So if you want a slower, more meditative brainwave, you're going to do a slower wavelength, you know, theta delta. Yes, yes. And if you're and if you're trying to be focused and people use uh, binaural beats to focus as well, you're going to do a beta mm -hmm. like faster moving brainwave. So anyway, regardless of if it works or not, it's nice because it's it's kind of consuming another sense that can distract you. So it's just a constant, you know, tone in your ear that's yeah. just just doing the woo 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 thing. And it, it, it kind of helps to add another layer of like, I'm just doing this. I'm just doing this. Um, dude, I imagine we've probably been talking a pretty long time. Yeah. <laughs> Holy shit. Yeah. Uh, this is awesome. Yeah. Of course. Um, have I asked you the questions before? Probably. Well, let's do them again. Yeah, let's see if they line changed. up. Let's say, uh, yeah. what's your favorite color? Blue. What's your favorite number? Three or five. What's That's your favorite call. animal? Dog, wolf, dolphin. Oh, Something those are like all that. amazing. Okay. Yeah. Dog, wolf, dolphin is a great answer. It's actually one animal. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> what is a practical cats tip? Too. I like cats. Yeah. Practical tip. Yeah. That's helped you that you could share with other people. Oh, like it's, it's so open-ended. It could mean anything. I know. I It can be as mundane or as sacred as you would like it to be. Don't eat breakfast. Don't I eat don't breakfast. eat breakfast. Really? Um, and and yeah, because and don't eat breakfast and don't eat after eight p.m. No. Oh. What if I don't eat breakfast but eat lots of junk food after eight p.m.? So, so the, the the whole rationale behind that <laughs> is you're going into an intermittent fasting state and you're giving your body a chance to recover from just constantly being in the digestive uh, process. And I mean that it is a it is a cellular stressor. So by giving your body that break, it can it, heal. It, it, it heals and. The main thing is you you can consume things, but don't consume like like large amounts of calories, basically. Right. So like I'll wake up and I'll have like um, bulletproof coffee right, right. style thing, which does have calories in it, but you're not processing any carbs. Like you're not processing thing. any solid like loads of food that right. are like going through your digestive tract. And plus, then you're getting um, a lot of nutrients into your brain through the um, MCT oil and stuff like that. I love it. Next time we're going to have to pick your brain about the health health stuff. Sure. Yeah. Dude, I'll thank you. Relay what little knowledge I have. Of course, <laughs> man. This has been great. Yeah. And for people that don't know, like Noah and I have been hanging out the last <laughs> And we're days. still not sick of each other. And we're so that's we're good. hanging we're hanging upstate at his place with the pup and the baby. <laughs> and, and and life's fun. And we're going to Cosm tonight. Yes, we are. Yeah. That's gonna be really fun. Yeah, really Maybe excited. we should bring this. We'll see. Bring the backpack. Yeah. I have some other fun stuff in there. Cool. Cool, man. Yeah. Let's go eat some food. All right. Peace.
Thanks for listening to that episode, Michael. Go check him out. ThirdEyeDrops.com is podcast on MindPodNetwork.com. A uh, really interesting guy. He, I, I think the episode with Evan Alexander is out. If it's not, then I just spoiled his little surprise for this week. But uh, that's a good one. I know. I haven't even heard it. I just know those two guys. Pretty fucking cool. So go check him out. Uh, thank you to all of the Patreons. Patreons? God, this Patreon is, is a weird word. Thank you to all the patrons who support me on Patreon. That's easy to say. Uh, that's it for this week. I have a huge backload. <laughs> it's also came out weird, uh, getting weirder. I have a backlog of uh, episodes and I'm debating what to do with them. I do not want to make episodes uh, exclusive on Patreon. Patreon, but I think I might do a level because I have so many where I release episodes a week earlier uh, if you become a certain level of Patreon um, subscriber. So I'll let you know the details of that. But in the meantime, just thank you for listening. Tell a friend, subscribe, whatever you want to do, whatever. I don't even care anymore. I just like that you're listening. I really appreciate it. So I will see you next week.